Um, uh, here we're now at uh, episode five of week three of the big game. That's the last episode. I uh, didn't play many hands in this episode, so I'll probably go into detail about the, each of the hands. I guess I only played three hands. And uh, I was probably about even at this point. Uh, I probably had a little bit of a loose image, um, which people like to do to kind of show off a little bit, especially on TV. But I usually like to cultivate a tight image, and then I can play more aggressively and steal a little more. If I have a loose image, you know, then I'll probably go back to tightening up. So that's maybe why I didn't play as many hands in this episode. Well, let's uh, see one of them. Five hundred thousand dollars. We haven't seen anyone reload for 500k just yet, but the knight's still young. Action starts with Barry Greenstein, King Queen suited. I like to say King Queen suited, such a strong hand. It's like you've got three cards to play with. Well, I don't think uh, as highly as King of King Queen suited as uh, as Joe Stapleton does, because you run into an ace suited and you make a flush. You don't have. Uh, the best one. It's obviously a hand I play in any position in a no limit game raising into the pot. But if I get re-raised with a king queen, uh, even when it's suited, you know I'm always afraid I'm up against ace king or maybe if the guy's uh, a little loose, even ace queen, I'm dominated. And obviously I have to worry about him having a pair of kings or a pair of queens. It's a tight player, and he raised me, and I have king queen suited. I may just even give it up uh, against a loose player. I'll probably call. Um, but it's not as great as he's making it out to be. Uh, maybe in Pinochle, I guess it's a marriage. It's uh, it's a little better. But of course, I play it. I raise him for fifteen hundred. Uh, the game here is two and four hundred blinds with a hundred ante. Uh, that hundred ante makes a little bit of a loose structure. Uh, normally in uh, No Limit, I raise to three times the big blind, which would be twelve hundred. But with an extra six hundred in the uh, in the antes. Uh, you know, raising up to 1500 is seems about uh, the right amount to me. He raises to 1500 and action folds around to the man on the button who has pocket jacks. That's Danny Alai. A lot of players will choose to re-raise big pocket pairs against an aggressive player like Barry Greenstein. Let's see how Danny handles it. I wish Stapes uh, wouldn't uh, ruin my image and say I'm an aggressive player. Call me a tight player. It gets me better action where I can get people to fold when I play... Uh, when I don't play on television. But anyway, uh, Danny raised a 5,200. 5, oh, and this, the way the structure is in this big game thing, you can raise uh, up to the size of the pot pre flop. So he could have, uh, let's figure out what the pot would be. He could call my 1,500 uh, before the raising. That Between us, that means 3,000. There are 600 in blinds, is 3,600, and 600 of the pot is 4,200. So he could call 15 and raise 42. He could have made it up to 5,700. Uh, and normal raise from good players is a three times raise, uh, a typical raise, um, would be, which would be 4,500. If I were re-raising, I'd usually make it between 4,500 to 5,000 with any hand I have. I wouldn't want to give away the strength of my hand. Uh, now, what you find with a lot of players, they raise a little more when they want you to fold and a little less when they want you to call. Uh, that's pretty typical. So uh, you might say Danny raised more than 4,500, should I be afraid? But that gives me a little feeling like he doesn't want me to play. You know, I don't think he has aces or kings. I think he has ace, queen, two jacks, two tens. He doesn't mind taking it down now in case I have overcard. So I'm not afraid of that little extra he put in. But Danny's a good player, so I'm going to assume that if he was screwing around with a 3-4 suited, he'd have made a 5,200. If he had aces, he'd have made a 5,200. I'm going to give him more credit than uh, you know just being your average player. Uh, so anyway, raise to 5,200. What am I going to do? Obviously, my choices are fold, call, and raise. And this is a hand that you know I'll take a flop with. We both got, uh, I think, 100,000 in front of us. And... Uh, um, you know, I, if I thought he was crazy and I could make him fold or I wanted to take control, I could re-raise, but it doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Call seems uh, uh, up like about the, uh, as in the, 
Goalie locks and three bearers. You know, raising is a little too aggressive. Folding is a little too passive. Calling seems about right. He re-raises to 5,200. Now over to Nadia Magnus. Trying to keep her profit and win some cash. She folds, as does Justin Bonomo, so now it's back to Barry. See Barry checking out Danny's stack size. Which took a crushing blow last night. Barry calls. Two to the flop. Now this is something they mentioned, and, I, and whenever I'm playing a pot, obviously it combines my hand in math we call it like a vector with components. There's my hand, in this case King Queen of Clubs, there's my opponent, Danny Alai, but there's also the state of uh, me and the state of my opponent. I'm usually pretty stable and I'm about even here so nobody should think I'm steaming. Danny, uh, they just point out, lost a big pot previously. They said the end of the night but actually these things are all recorded in one session and then chopped up into sessions. So if Danny's stuck and he lost a pot, you know, I may factor in that he might be a little more aggressive in steaming. So that's part of that whole component of the way, that, uh, or that's an, one of the components of what I'm thinking about as I play this hand. He might be playing a little more aggressively than normal. Uh, right now we see the pot's 11,600, and so I'm expecting on almost any flop uh, he's on the button, I'm in front of him, I'm going to check to him, and he's going to bet around half the pot, and that would be around 6,000. Maybe, you know, sometimes up to like three-quarters of the pot, uh, which is 12,000, 8,000. So I'm expecting a bet between six and 8,000. And if I don't get something in that range, then I'm going to have to think about why did he bet less, why did he bet more. At this point, we're at no limits, no longer pot limit, no limit. Five, queen, king, top two pair for Greenstein. Barry's only behind to fives, kings, or queens. Barry checks. He slow plays it. That's right. He's checking to the... Well, you know, this is obviously a great flop for myself, and with 100,000 in front of me, um, which uh, I often think of my stack size in terms of big blinds, uh, two and 400 blind... Uh, 100,000, well, that's a lot of big blinds. That's 250 big blinds. But a top two pair, if, I, if I'm beat by him having a set, I'm probably going to go broke on this hand. Uh, I'm not going to get away, we've, especially we've already got the pot built up to 11,000. I've got 10 times that. It, it's going to go in. So I'm not thinking of ways to get away from my hand in case he did flop a set. I'll, I'll be beat. I'm, you know, obviously very happy with the flop, and and hoping he'll bet, and you know, I'm already thinking, am I going to raise, and how much am I going to raise, or am I going to slow play, and what I'm going to do. So obviously, I'm expecting Danny. Uh, even though it's a bad flop to him, he didn't like to see the two over cards. Uh, as people know, I heads up, I continuation bet pretty much 100% of the time because I actually think it costs me less in the long run when I'm wrong, and and you know, it allows me to get away when the bets may be bigger later on another street, where I've you know, played it weekly and now I don't know what to do if the guy's trying to bluff or if he really has something. So I'd rather just bet right now if I was Danny and if I get check raised, obviously fold. Uh, and if I get called, you'll probably check it down and hope the guy had a straight draw, whether it's a gut shot like an ace-jack or an ace-10 or whether it's an open-ended straight like a jack-10. So, uh, and I'm, a Danny continuation bets a fair amount. But a lot of the young players these days, they, they will check against bad flops, and they try to balance that by checking when they've got something also. Let's say checking an ace-queen for pot control uh, in case I have a king, which they know I'm not going to fold. Uh, one of the reasons I don't like to check is I already gave one reason because I think I might get away cheaper betting, actually, than checking. And also, I don't want to give free cards to people who have gut shot draws. And people have small pairs where they make sets on me in the turn and I end up paying it off because I feel I played the hand slow to begin with. So, like I said, I'll bet. Let's see what Danny does. Razor, he wants to let Danny keep betting. He doesn't bite, though. Yeah, you, know, you know, Danny checked. And a lot of people would say that's a better fundamental play. Check. Hope to keep the pot small. But now if I bet, which I do, especially against people who uh, check most of the time when they're weak, Sometimes I'll just steal it from him on the turn with nothing. 
but I know Danny's more the type of player that can check with a little piece of the flop with the queen or like this hand, and I might not be able to, uh, to take it down from him. But I think with a draw, he will often, if he had jack-10, he would have bet, he probably wouldn't have three-bet me either, and, and maybe gotten his free card on the turn. Uh, you know, tried to get two cards since he's behind me by betting. Uh, we'd seen me do that uh, in a previous episode. Okay, now the nine came, and I'm faced with a, a very clear problem. And the problem is, should I bet now and probably take the pot down if he was checking because he didn't like the flop or he had an ace jack, was trying to get a gut shot, you know, hit the gut shot without putting more money in, or he had two jacks or two tens and, you know, that type of hand. Um, if I bet and he has those other hands, he's probably just going to give it up. That king-queen just look, will look too bad. I thought it was better to check again, and I'm pretty sure that's what I, I did, and get him to now act, because he did three bet me, he showed some strength, and whether he was screwing around or had something decent, he's probably going to think, well, if I check twice, most poker players say to themselves, if they check twice to me, I'm going to take the pot. And I know Danny's a good player, and I know he'll often have that thought. The diamonds on the turn. Barry's trying to figure out if he should bet or if another check might get Danny to bet at it this time. Barry checks again. Danny probably didn't like the two overcards on the flop. Let's see if the fact that it was checked to him twice changes anything. It does. Danny fires 7,200. Now that's a pretty normal size bet at this point, uh, and it's what I was hoping would happen. And now I have to decide whether to call and try to act like I had, let's say, a flush draw or something like that. Uh, you know, I picked up a flush draw and maybe a gut shot, who knows, um, or to raise. Now by calling which I'd be more likely to do, if, or more inclined to do if I were behind him than in front of him. That works if I think he's going to bet again on the river. But I think if I call here and he's got the hand that I think he has, uh, you know, the good hands are the jacks and the tens, um, I think he's just going to check on the river. I don't think I'm going to get anything more. And if he has jacks or tens, I'm giving him a free card. So that's why I don't like to call. Or maybe he has ace jack of diamonds and you know has a really big draw. Again, I don't really want to give him that free draw. I want to make him pay for it. And if he has the hand that's screwing around, like a you know some goofy hand like three four of clubs, and he three bet me light. Well, those kind of hands that totally missed and still are bad, he would have bet those on the flop. So those really aren't in the picture right now. It's really a case of does he have a draw or does he have something like jacks or tens. And in all those situations, it's probably better for me to play my hand right now and raise. And if he, like, somehow, you know, flopped a set, and, you know, good players usually won't check their sets on the flop because they need to balance it against the times they bet with nothing. So I don't think he has a set. I think I have the best hand, and I think not raising him now is just uh, uh, going to be costly in the long run. It'll be giving him a free card. Danny's made this bet for protection and a little bit of value. You can tell Barry loves his hand by the way he looks like he's about to fall asleep. He's really just dreaming about how to milk Danny, though. Barry could be giving off one of his classic coma tells. Well, what was I doing? I had pretty quickly decided I was going to raise, I'm pretty sure, but now I have to pick an amount. So before you find out what I raised, what would you raise? Well, uh, the way you think about pot size is first you add in your call. That's what the guy will be looking at. He'll be looking at the size of the pot he has to call against. So when I put in the extra 7,200, they already included Danny's 7,200 when they came up with that 18.8 figure. That gets the pot up to 26,000. So a pot size raise is me raising him 26,000. That's a lot. Normally, again, you bet like half the pot uh, on top of the, the, the raises is a more normal bet that could either be stealing, you know, or it could be a good hand. And again, you know, I'm usually going to pick a bet that 
doesn't give away which, you know, like if I had a real big hand, I'm not going to bet a lot to, uh, because I, I like my hand so much, or I'm not going to bet a little to suck them in. I'm going to bet the same amount pretty much no matter what the strength of my hand is once I decide to raise. Half the pot is an extra 13000 so I'm usually going to bet between half and three quarters. So probably the minimum I'd ever raise is making it, taking it 7,200, adding an extra 13,000, betting raising 20,000. More typically, so it's going to be maybe closer up to about uh, making it a $25,000 bet, a raise of a, a little more than half the pot. So I expect I'm going to you know, bet somewhere between 20 and 25,000, closer to 25,000. Well, Barry wakes up and raises to 23 grand. Okay, 23. Barry's decided that now's the time to try to extract some value. He would definitely like to see Danny call. Danny does have the best shot draw. He put and I'm not really figuring those things out all the time on the fly. You know, very often somebody bets an amount. You make it about three times what they bet it. That's kind of a, a normal rule of thumb. He made it 7,200. Three times that is almost twenty-two thousand, maybe a little more, twenty-three thousand. Uh, price him out of his draw a little bit, um, and now he's, you know, he's of course now upset he didn't take his free card, and he knows I kind of fooled him into betting, but you know, uh, you know, my operation went successful. It's kind of hard for him to keep giving me free cards too. If I've picked up a flush draw, he wants to make me pay. So, you know, he did what most people would have done, I think. And now he's faced with a decision. Can he raise and get me off my hand? You always have three choices. Can you raise and get the guy to fold when you don't think you have the best hand or you don't have that good hand, which is the case here? Should you call and try to, to improve or call because you think you have the best hand? Yeah, this raise is ugly for him. He doesn't really think he has the best hand. And he really thinks if he calls, he's probably got six outs, four tens and two jacks. Uh, you know, with... Uh, 40 some cards in the deck, you know, he's uh, more than a six to one dog. He really can't profitably call that extra, let's say, 15,000 or so and think he's getting six to one on his, on his money. He's going to be getting, uh, if he puts in an extra 15,000, he's getting less than three to one out of the pot to start. And then the extra money we get, we, you know, we talk about implied odds, the odds he'll get from if he hits this hand getting paid off. He's not going to get an extra. Uh, you know, forty some thousand out of me on the next street, and you might say, "Well, why not?" You know, that would be a normal bet at that next point. Well, the problem is, if he hits those hands, the board looks so ugly to me, he may not get called. Uh, you know, the times he hits. So then you might say, "Well, then why not call and act like you hit?" Well, because if a deuce comes off, he can't act like he hit the straight. It's only if a jack or a ten comes off, it looks like a straight, or maybe a diamond, it looks like he hit something. So too many cards come off that he can't sell that he drew out on me. So the 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 short of it is, uh, he's just not getting the odds, even counting implied odds, to call here, and he's probably just going to have to give it up. Puts Barry on a value raise, he can win it with a ten or a jack, but he's not getting the right price. Danny also only has 53k behind. It's not likely that he would just call. Danny's reaching for chips. Danny's trying to determine whether this is a value raise or whether it's actually a bluff. And he goes with the former and folds. Good laid on by Danny. Pretty, pretty normal decision by each of us, but the key good thing I did in this hand is checked a second time to a good aggressive player who's probably going to try to pick up the pot at that point. Two dollars. Two aces? Obviously Jack Tim Wilson. Uh oh, Barry just told a lie. Yeah, and I wasn't really lying about my hand. I just, as a matter of while the session's going on, I don't talk about my hands that aren't shown. If someone wants to see my hand, they're just going to have to pay for it. You know, that's the way you, you make them feel. You don't want to give them information for free. So if people ask me about my hand uh, during the play, uh, and when I say during the play, it's because on these televised things, after the session's over, I'm sure I would have told Danny what I had. Anyway, 
you know, like if there's a pair on the board, I'll tell people, boy, nice laid on I had quads. Uh, or I'll hit top full or pre-flop if they raise I had aces. And again, I'll do it laughing and joking. And so I was just joking around with him here. But Danny said he wanted to see it because he's a little frustrated at this point that he didn't check again. <laughs> I only saw like 5% of it. Action continues. Jason Mercier folds. Cassidy folds. Over to Danny Alai. I can't say his name now without cracking up. Don't worry, you'll get over it. Naughty on the butt. Naughty, a fold of queen five of hearts on the button. That's a hand most people raise on the button, especially, especially a loose structure. Uh, like I said earlier, she's tightened up her game a little. She's she's ahead. And, you know, it's not that she's a bad player she tightened up her game. It's a loose cannon trying to come away with money that she can't make any other way uh, normal for she should tighten up because as we saw in earlier sessions she raised with that stuff Justin or myself are likely to three better with almost anything she just can't afford to come in with garbage right now uh, the way uh, you know this this whole big came uh, setup is because you know we will come after her uh, relentlessly if she raises uh, in uh, too frequently. And folds. Justin Bonomo limps in. Now look what he did. He limped in with an ace. I, you know, normally raise an ace. Most people normally raise. But he's mixing it up, which is a reasonable thing to do. And, you know, he's going to get a flop. Sometimes if he limps and I raise, he might even re-raise. Uh, just because, uh, you know, I'm in a position now. We haven't seen my hand yet. I don't like people limping in my small blind, and a lot of times I'll try to steal from them. Except against weak players, if I if they're limping and let me get away where I would have folded if they'd raised, I'll encourage them to limp. But also, a lot of times good players will try to take advantage of you by getting a lot of free flops with you, and I don't want to let them do that. So it's a cat and mouse game of uh, whether it's okay for me to let them to limp because they're letting me see cheap flops with my bad hands, or whether I don't want to let them play their bad hands uh, to free flops in the small blind. So you see what the two issues are there. So let's see what I have and let's see how I handle it. Jack four off suit for Barry. Okay, now I have total garbage. And so I probably should be happy to take a free flop. But Justin's ahead and I'm saying, I don't want this kid to think he can just limp in my blinds. It's almost like a you know, kind of uh, you know, saying, you know, I don't think you're going to try to push me around. I think I can do what I want with you. I can get free flops when I want, and I can raise you out when I want. I, I don't want anyone thinking they can they can do that to me. Looks like he might be getting a little frisky with his big blind. Oh, I got the four, so I So I had to choose an amount to raise to. Uh, the pot at this point before my raise, you remember it had my 400, Justin's 400, 800, and extra 1600 is 1400. Uh, so I raised actually the size of the pot. Maybe this gave away something because uh, uh, I made it 1800. That was the most I could raise to. Um, so it, he might feel that I'm just trying to take it away right now, which was the truth. But even with a good hand, I think I'd raise to about that because, again, it's one of these double-think situations. Pot's not that big at this point. I'd be trying to build a pot. Um, you know, it's not the same as a re-raise situation where I might not raise the full amount I could. This is just a you know beginning raise situation, uh, building a pot. Um, anyway, now some people are going to say, what are you doing? You have jack-4 offsuit. Why are you putting in so much money with that? But remember, my philosophy is I don't mind raising with bad hands if I think I can take the pot down. I'd almost rather raise with garbage than something in between where I want to see a flop, like an ace suited even. Um, because garbage I can get away from very easily. He ray raises, obviously I'm going to fold. It's not like I really feel I lost that much that I had a good draw to. So I'll raise with garbage anytime I think I can take it down. And that's what I thought here. thought I could probably take it down right now. And if I had Justin's hand at a6, I'd probably fold. But he knows this was a hand he normally even raises with. So he's thinking his operation of limping probably wasn't successful. 
And he's got some choices. He does have an ace. He could re-raise. He has an ace that's got some value he could call. Or he could just say, I wish I would have raised so I'm not in this kind of guessing game uh, of whether Barry's got a hand or not. I wish I would have raised initially, and now I'm just going to get out of this because I'm on the guess. Notice I have put him to a really guessing situation. A6 offsuit's a garbagey hand. He's got 18 total, right? I thought I was under raising. Barry's trying to take control of this pot. Call. Justin calls. And now, what's your thought about the hand right now? How do I sit with this piece of garbage against Justin's ace? I'm a favorite. Well, not on the board. You see, I'm a 60-40 dog. But I, as the aggressor, have the betting lead. I'm also behind him. He's not in good shape on this hand, even though if you looked at the percentages and you just look at hands, you might think he is. He's in trouble. And I usually don't do what he just did there. I would have raised with his hand, and I, don't, I wouldn't call it a re-raise with hands. I don't like calling with bad hands. Justin does it a little more than I do. He's got a lot of confidence in his after-the-flop play, and he feels there's enough value in his hand that he doesn't want to give it up. And he'll float me and he'll do all sorts of things, and he knows, I'm gonna, he knows the way I play. I raised him. I'm going to bet. I could have garbage. Uh, he's not as sold on the tight image I've been trying to sell on some of the other uh, broadcasts. But he's played with me enough to know I'm capable of anything. A blind versus blind. Nine jack, eight, two diamonds. Top pair for Barry. Bottom of checks. Now, obviously, the good news and the bad news. The good news is I flopped top pair. I probably have the best hand right now. The bad news is it's a very connected board. If he limped with the, let's say, a 10-7, obviously he's got the joint. A queen-10, he'd probably raise pre-flop. I don't, you know, most people wouldn't limp with that hand. Um, maybe add some small connector, a 7-6. Well, obviously he's got a straight draw. It's a very connected board. Obviously I'd rather seen jack-8 deuce, or specifically jack-4 deuce, making top two pair. That's a little too much to ask for. You know, I can't complain. Now, at this point, uh, the pot, as we saw with the, uh, well, let's subtract 2,500. It was 4,200. Again, got to bet about half the pot, uh, you know, which had been 2,100. Um, my last bet was 18, maybe up to, you know, here 2,500. Always usually between half and three-quarters of the pot. Three-quarters of the pot uh, uh, would have been almost, uh, I guess, 3,300. Now, I'm not doing all these calculations, even though they're pretty simple for me to do the, the arithmetic. But I'm betting, you know, I'm kind of just used to betting a little bit more than I did before with my raise. Uh, as I've said before, in normal situations where it's a raise and a call, if it's head up, I'm usually betting about one and a half times what the previous bet was. So maybe I'm doing that calculation, which is a little more simpler than adding everything up in the pot. Um, so 2500 is a pretty reasonable size bet. Obviously, at this point, Justin's totally with the flop. And, uh, you know, I have hit the top pair. We expect this to be the end. Barry fires 2,500. Bottom or nose, Barry will continuation bet with just about any two cards. In this case, Barry does have top pair. Justin comes over. Well, look at this. And, and that's what... A lot of people say is a fallacy in my continuation betting all the time in heads up and, and usually three-handed pots. They mistake it that they think they do all the time. No, I don't in four-handed pots. Uh, but when it's heads up, yeah, I will. And so a lot of people say, well, it makes it easier to check, raise me, and take pots away. But when you do that, you're putting a lot of money in, and you're going to guess wrong enough of the time when you put that money in that it's not as easy to exploit as people think. Uh, although I still remember this hand and when he raised me I did I was worried because I have top pair but if he's legitimately raising I've got the worst hand but again you know poker with against good players that's not like bad players who aren't gonna make these plays playing against a guy like Justin he's gonna put me to the test and so I just thought that my hand had too much value to fold here he could have played me off this hand if he kept firing but he's gotta worry that I've got a straight or queen 10 or jack set, sorry, 10 7. You know, calling here behind him puts a lot of pressure on him to keep firing too. 
So I thought it was better to call. It's certainly re-raising. It could just get me in a lot of trouble. But calling keeps some control there, and I'm behind him, and now he's going to have to take another stab. You know, he took this stab, raised me. Is he going to continue on? We can see by my hand that even with top pair, if he really just kept firing big bullets, I'd probably have had to given it up. But let's see what what uh, what goes on. For the top to eight thousand. Bottom has chosen a dicey moment to try to make a play with this check raise. Barry knows that Justin knows he's likely to fire with anything. And Barry calls. Yeah, and Joe, uh, I like to criticize him for fun because. Uh, He's pretty clueless. Joe, just kidding, Joe. Actually, Joe has been unbelievable in calling this uh, big game stuff. But we've got to give Jimmy Fricky Man of the Year uh, uh, nominations for making it sound like Joe Stapleton knows what he's talking about when it comes to poker. Anyway, but Joe and Jimmy did get this right. You know, Jimmy's the guy behind the scenes helping Joe out with the poker. Um, and... Uh, uh, Joe's got it exactly right. I didn't like when I got raised. I certainly considered folding. I couldn't beat anything but a bluff or a draw. You know, a bluff or a semi-bluff. But with all those considerations that we talked about, I thought it was right for me to call. He's hiding well, but Justin did not want to see a call there. Five of spades on the turn, giving Bonomo a gut shot straight draw. And now Justin could, you know, of course, even when the five came, I was hoping for a four or a jack. A five, if he somehow was semi-bluffing with a straight draw, he made that straight if he had uh, six, seven. So I didn't like seeing the five. I really didn't want to face another bet, especially a big one here, 15,000. He probably, he probably would have taken it down if he fired again. And uh, But I don't remember that bad feeling, so I think I, uh, I know that he didn't. After Barry called his check raise so quickly, he's probably contemplating whether or not he wants to fire another blank. I don't think I called that quickly. I think I deliberated the amount I'll deliberate with a straight or with what I had. So I tried to, to keep my tempo the same. No fire. Bottom of checks. Okay, now what should I do? He checked to me. I think I have the best hand. But I didn't want to step into that thing that uh, Danny Lai stepped into the last hand where the water looks safe, so now I bet, and then I get check raised off my hand. It seemed much better to control the pot, even though I might be giving a free card here, but he's shown so much, uh, you know, he showed aggression that previous street. I don't want to give up the check raise, and I think I can keep the pot small, and maybe if he doesn't fire too big on the river, I can call and possibly make some extra money that way when he's bluffing. So I thought it was better to keep what they say, exercise some pot control by just checking, keeping it small. Yeah, I was aware it's a very dangerous board. I, I could, I'm probably giving them free cards. I don't like doing that. If the pot had kind of gone a different way where I'd bet the flop and he called, I would have actually probably bet again on the turn and then maybe decide to check on the river. The bet on the turn to make him pay for his draw or maybe pay if he has second pair. And Barry checks. Six of clubs on the river. Now I'm thinking, ah, this is ugly. If he had any kind of straight draw, he hit it. Hopefully he just had some goofy flush draw, king, deuce of diamonds, or something like that. Um, and uh, if he had bet here, uh, yeah, I probably would have paid it off because I could beat the flush draw. Because the straight, just having a seven by itself doesn't make as much sense as having a ten. Right, a 10 is the open-end straight draw on the flop. A 7, does he really? did he really raise me with the bottom end of a gut shot? Not as likely. Um, actually, raise me with total error. That's in some sense more likely than the thin draw in a lot of cases. It's like either a good hand, a good draw, or nothing are, are the ways people often raise. But if he fired a lot, I guess I would have folded. Uh, if he bet a little, I probably would have called. Uh, Club, so Bonomo gets a piece of it. That pair probably won't change anything for Justin. He has some showdown value at this point, but not for... Yeah, he has showdown value if I had no pair and if I had a draw, so it gives him reason to check. And at this point, I'm saying to myself, if he couldn't bet, 
the last two streets, I probably have the best hand. And so now the question is, should I bet? But there's another consideration. If I'm wrong and he's just fooling me, like trying to get me to bet, uh, you know, obviously that's not a good thing. The question I have to ask myself is, what is going to call me? I could have had a seven in my hand when I called, maybe, you know, seven of diamonds and a diamond draw, who knows. Um, I, it's hard for me to figure out what he's going to call me with now. I guess 10-9 or queen-9 or something like that, second pair that he raised me with. He could call me with those hands, so that, those are those are hands I could value bet. So a value bet here isn't out of the question because I did check on the previous street. Maybe it is the right thing to value bet. Um, I, I really didn't know what to do. I was so glad, frankly, he didn't fire that bullet on the turn that I was happy, even though I thought I had the best hand, I was happy to take down the pot at this point. But, you know, maybe I should have value bet. Let's see. I'm pretty sure that I didn't. And let's, uh, you know, let's see what happens. Very much. Goes check, check. And Barry takes it down. Even a river bluff probably wouldn't have chased Barry out. I didn't mind. I mean, sometimes you're embarrassed to show garbage like this. Uh, but I didn't mind kind of saying, don't limp on my territory. You're going to get raised. Uh, you know, and, you know, hopefully next time he tries that, uh, you know, I'll, I might raise him again. Uh, eventually, if I keep raising him, he's going to limp with good hands. Usually the next time the guy does it, especially when I show him that bad hand, it's actually not a good hand the second time because he's thinking he'll never think I'm limping with garbage again. He, and he got away with the first time. He's not going to re-raise me. Second time the guy limps with garbage again. The third time. The guy's waiting to set you up with a big hand to get you to raise. Uh, but anyway, those are the kinds of things that go through your head of when you're playing all these different limping, checking, raising with nothing type of games. So well, let's let's let this hand run out with commentary. Monster hands. Yeah. Greenstein wins a pot of more than twenty grand. Okay, so you know people got to saw see that we were each dancing there. And it's not like the rest of the table didn't notice it. They're good players. This is actually the last of the three Great. hands I played. If Nadia doesn't look too happy, it's because she's come off a little less than 30000 from her peak. Danny Alai looking at 10-4. That's out of here. Nadia, pocket pair. Oops. Looks like so, uh, yeah. Raises to 1400 Bonomo calls. Sorry Queen 10 that. suited. King Jack for Barry Greenstein. Okay. Barry's not going anywhere well, with... Um, Nadia raised with fives. Justin called Queen 10 of diamonds. Normal call. I have King Jack off suit. Joe was about to say I'm not going anywhere with face cards. That's not true. I think this hand is garbage. I don't like calling. Even in position with King Jack off suit. It's a hand that's very easily dominated. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, there's good value in it, you're in position, and that's okay if that's the way they feel. When I have these marginal hands, if there wasn't any, I'd probably just fold it uh, or raise. You'll see me raising, and I've said this many times, I'll raise with my marginal or with my bad hands that I decide to play more often than I'll call with them. I'll try to take control because, as we've seen, there's extra value in taking control. You can win pots lots of ways if you're the pre-flop raiser. Uh, calling, you have to hit, and you have to hope they don't hit something better. And this is the kind of hand that, even when you hit, sometimes they hit something better. Maybe I'd hit a king and a jack. It comes with an ace or nine, Justin's going to make a straight, as we can see. So, you know, pot limit before the flop, I'm going to raise a little less than the pot, probably. But, uh, you know, I know I played this hand, so I know what I did is I, I raised... And so uh, why don't you try to figure out before I do what I'm going to raise to? Well, they already tell you they're the pot's 4,000, so they added everything up for you. We could have done it again by ourselves. Uh, so if I put in 1,400, that makes the pot 5,400. So the most I could raise to is 6,800. That might look like I'm trying to take it away. Uh, maybe uh, you know 6,000 to 6,500 is a better raise. Uh, but somewhere in that range, that's what I'm about to raise to. 
paint in his hand. Certainly not on the button. Raised to 6,500. Mercier folds. Cassidy folds. I don't think these guys haven't noticed Nadia's change in demeanor as well. They know she's probably going to tighten up to stop the bleeding. Barry senses dead money, and this is his way of getting it. Nadia does fold. You know, I see dead people. Barry sees dead money. <laughs> well, Justin's not going anywhere. Justin knows exactly what Barry's capable of. And, uh, you know, we can see in the hand matchup, I'm a favorite. Um, you know, but Justin's got a nice hand to play and be able to semi-bluff with if he hits uh, straight or flush draws. Uh, you know, I hit my jack, comes jack nine. You know, Justin's going to be in there playing with me, especially with two diamonds. Uh, you know, we, we could see some uh, fireworks because, you know, our hands are, like, interlocked. You know, one of us hits, the other one's probably going to pick up a draw. But... More important than that 5842, it wouldn't really matter if I had Justin's hand and he had my hand a lot. I mean, it's probably better to have the, the higher percentage hand. But the key thing right now is I'm behind him and I've got the betting lead. That puts him at a big disadvantage. Is he going to make one of those plays like he did before with, with nothing? Well, that can be pretty costly. Even against a guy like me, he knows whether I've got a hand or whether I'm screwing around. He's about to face a bet. And, you know, it's, it, and if he's going to take me off of that bet, he's going to have to spend a lot of money. And he's going to be wrong a fair amount of time because I, I don't, I mean, we've seen me three bet a lot of garbage uh, on this show. But, you know, I do once in a while pick up aces and kings and things like that, too. So, uh, uh, you know, it's not like I'm a total crazy three better. Uh, you you got to give me some respect. So two to the flop. Brian's going to have the slight lead. 7-4 Trey, two clubs. No help to either player. Barry's still ahead, and he was the pre-flop aggressor. Bonomo has checked on over to Barry Greenstein. Man, is it a bad flop? When I saw that flop, what did I think? I thought, well, I hope he doesn't have a small pair that made a set, or even a pair of fives or sixes, uh, where he has a, you know, a pair in a straight draw. But if he has big cards, like I have some big cards, I'm probably going to win the pot right here. And you know that's how you make money in No Limit Hold'em is you take the lead, nobody hits anything, you take the pot down. It's tougher against good players like Justin who can do stuff back at you, but against most players, you just keep picking up these pots without showing your hand. That's the way in a tournament you get a hold of chips, and that's the way in a side game how you get a hold of cash. Uh, what am I going to bet, I guess, is the next question. I had made it 6500 the pot's 15000 Half of that is, uh, is what, 7800 Um you know, like I said, I usually bet between half and three quarters. I uh, made it 6,800. So, you know, we're expecting to see a nine or ten thousand dollar bet right here. He bets 8,500. That was not the flop we wanted. It wasn't even the right. And see, I didn't over bet. It didn't give anything away about my hand. I would have made the same bet with aces. Uh, and so, nothing for him to read there about from my bet sizing. And Obviously, like you said, wasn't the flop he was looking at. He's going to have to take a really big leap to uh, try to take the pot away from me. Of course, we know it would have worked, but it's not going to work enough of the time for him to try plays like that. Color. And Justin folds. The see that works for Barry this time. Nadia Magnus can feel the clock ticking and see her stack shrinking. And with that, Barry's back in the black, up 13. Okay, so that's it uh, for this last session. I ended up winning, I think, a little over 30000 for uh, for this uh, week of the big game. Not a lot, but I, I really didn't have a lot of hands to play. Um, I don't remember feeling... Uh, there was one hand against Jason I didn't like uh, played, and I discussed some of them earlier. Uh, I didn't think I did anything really stupendous, although I got away with some bluffs and semi-bluffs. Um, and, you know, it's kind of was like a nothing session. Didn't have a lot of hands, didn't do much. Won 30000 Well, you know, that's better than nothing. 